So welcome to the uh, community informational session for the uh, George H. Mitchell, Mitchell Elementary School project. Thanks for coming out. Our goal tonight, well, my, my name is John Garrish. I'm the chairman of the um, Mitchell School Building Committee. And our goal tonight is to bring you up to date on the work that's been done in the planning, including our uh, best estimate so far on the cost talk about schedule and then we'll get into a little bit of detail for the uh, configuration that we've been advancing to schematic design. So tonight we have uh, Superintendent Swenson. We, uh, I don't know if I'll go through everybody, but um, we have uh, town manager here, Sister Dutton. We have um, the professionals that are helping us um, study this, plan this, they're doing a great job. They, they, know, they know schools, they know the MSBA process, which is extremely helpful. <coughs> of course, we have some of the staff and then the volunteer, other volunteers of the committee. So I guess the first thing we wanted to do um, is just recap how we got to where we're at. And um, so if we start on the left, of course, everybody's familiar with uh, back in February of 2015, we, we did have the school roof collapse. As part of that process, uh, an assessment was done, essentially a structural assessment um, that determined the damage was more than just an isolated spot due to, due to heavy, heavy loading in any one given area. We found that there were structural deficiencies in the way the roof was constructed, constructed and the materials that we used. Um, it's a pretty comprehensive report. It's available online and if you are interested in looking at it. So <clears throat> the next phase was for us to uh, decide to go into the MSBA uh, school uh, funding program because we thought that was a better better approach for the for the town. So that process started and it, um, allowed us to uh, get into the program, uh, select the team, which you see here. Um, the team worked to develop the preliminary, preliminary design program. <laughs> preliminary design program, there's too many acronyms. Uh, <clears throat> That set us on the course for the uh, configuration that you're going to see tonight and that we presented uh, in some of the other working sessions that we've had for the community. So you can see on this on the graph there where we are. Um, we have some cost information that uh, hasn't been made public yet because it's still uh, in its uh, final stages of refinement. I think that's going to be presented to the committee next week. But we are, um, our cost estimates are, uh, we have two independent cost estimators and that, that number is converging. Um, and we have high confidence that, that that's the right number and it's, uh, it's just below. Um, our program amount, and we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. The next steps, of course, are to to finish the schematic um, schematic design and get that submitted to the school building authority and have them uh, approve that, so that we can ultimately get get on uh, the ballot and hopefully have the town uh, support the uh, construction of the school building. What's not on this chart is, uh, you know, two key dates. When will we start construction? We'll present a schedule on that, but could be as early as November of next year if we stay we stay on track. Even as early as May, one of the uh, one of the schedule alternatives. And then the goal is to get the students into their first day in September of 2022. We really didn't say how we wanted to handle questions, did we? Okay. Okay. So we're going to try to keep them to the end, if that works. <clears throat> so as 
part of the prior process that we went through. We ended up with what we've identified as study option C6.1, and the team here is going to go through that in more detail. But there are many different reasons why we selected this option as a committee. Um, you know, the main one being it really met the long-term educational program um, that uh, the school district is looking to to advance. It supported the program and the structure within within the building. The any of the renovation renovation with repair options that we looked at really didn't provide the best value because we were because of the issues we mentioned I mentioned earlier we couldn't just fix the building um, when we evaluated that cost the cost really wasn't that much higher to go to a, a newer school a new school that had would have a configuration that was very efficient for the for the current program and the future program so that was one of the main reasons um, I won't go through all these, but because um, we have some of that we'll talk about it, but with any new school, you get the efficiency, the energy efficiency, and you get a longer life. So uh, part of that energy efficiency, we're looking to reduce the maintenance costs and the operating costs, and you have a lot more flexibility with a new school, new school building uh, when you can do that. I guess with that, I'm going to turn it over. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to turn it over to Scott Walker. Thanks, John. Uh, so I'm Scott Walker. I'm a um, member of the committee. Uh, I guess I said this at the time. Um, were any of you at our community workshops that we had? There you go. Um, so we had two community workshops in which one at the senior center um, and then another one just last week uh, in the library and the idea of the workshop was to get people a little closer in discussing uh, questions and thoughts with some of the team um, instead of just a situation like this you're able to sit at a table and really interact we got a lot of really good feedback um, let me switch the next one. Sorry. Um, and we came up with a lot of things that, as you can see, this is kind of a general idea. Some of the things that came up that people brought up. And when this was brought up, we also integrated a lot of the ideas into the designs. Um, things that went on to increase uh, security, I think traffic flow. Um, a, lot of, a lot of things that people thought were really good ideas to, to bring up. People, you know, there's, uh, for instance, someone who lived lives right next to the school and he had thoughts as a neighbor what is you know what are his thoughts and things that he thinks of that nobody else might and so we thought of those and integrated what we could uh, it's been very useful um, if we plan on another one uh, i highly recommend that anybody uh, keep an eye on the website for email list so that you can see what another one is, is. Um, because you can come and interact a little more personally with the team and be able to get how uh, much you can uh, add your two cents and it really will affect the outcome. So uh, that's one of the things we've done to try to get the community involved. And I hope <coughs> I'm going to turn it over now to Derek Swenson. Scott. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Um, I was charged with uh, the responsibility of submitting an educational profile to the MSBA. It was about a 40 page document. And basically, what came of that was uh, what we felt as though needed to be incorporated within a 21st century school. The information I got was from my background, but also we did a number of site visits uh, throughout the Commonwealth of Newburgh Construction and one in New Hampshire. And we also had an educational visioning. Uh, group over the summer that comprised, was comprised of uh, teachers, we had community members, we had a representative from the town council, we actually had students on this committee. And with that, we came up with uh, some ideas that we want to incorporate within this building. First being that we wanted to incorporate what I called grade level clusters or little neighborhoods 
So basically, if anyone knows the original Mitchell, it was a, a E-shaped building, and we had um, grade levels scattered throughout. Um, basically, what we want to do is house all of our pre-K students together, we want to house all of our kindergarten students together, and all of our first and second grade um, together as well. Programmatically, that works for us uh, from an educational standpoint. It also provides our teachers the ability to do collaborative lessons, but also do collaborative planning as well. Um, it also cuts down on the amount of transition time, especially for some of our special needs students. And what we actually did was incorporate uh, special needs uh, classrooms within each of these wings that were uh, based upon the population of student or our grade level. Each of the special education programs have what we call uh, regulation rooms for students that may become dysregulated throughout the course of, um, of the day. And it's kind of a cool down space to our calming space for those students, and those are incorporated into those little neighborhoods too, so they're not just housed in one area of the building, they're incorporated within the general setting, which uh, we want as a district, but also what the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education um, expects as well. We have very flexible classroom space to meet the educational programs. Um, <clears throat> these classrooms are much bigger and larger than the classrooms that the uh, teachers are currently uh, in at the uh, Mitchell at the Middle, which is the former high school. We have also have um, some environments of uh, STEAM and STEM, STEM stands for Science, Technology, um, Engineering, and Mathematics, and the STEAM, the A is part. So we have a maker space, which is a project-based um, classroom where students can go in and do hands-on projects based upon what they're learning within their science curriculums, math curriculums, or art. So that space is incorporated within this design as well. Also a very flexible uh, layout that allows us for future expansion, should we feel as though we're going to have an influx of students coming in um, at this grade level. We'll have some flexibility if we have to need to transition some of these spaces that um, are currently uh, for other purposes into an actual classroom should we have to add a first um, grade or a second grade or a kindergarten or pre-k at some point. If you look at the original Mitchell too, uh, with that east shape, you have three entrances to that building. That's really a safety and security issue for us. We truly wanted to have one main entrance <clears throat> um, for increased uh, security and a centralized administrative suite, which you see here on that, um, would be that first floor level uh, there, thank you, Gene. That main way that came into that um, main entrance would be in what's called a pedestrian trap, meaning that it would allow you to come in that first level and then you'd actually have to be buzzed in to the administrative suite if you wanted to actually enter the physical plan. That administrative suite, too, houses the principal, the assistant principal, our school psychologists, our school adjustment counselors, and our nurse. The original, the original design of the Mitchell had all of those spaces scattered throughout the site. We thought it was important to have a centralized administrative suite. Um, natural daylight. There is um, research that states that students do, uh, student performance does increase with natural um, daylight. So we have incorporated some skylights and with some um, ways of means of allowing that light to come all the way down to that ground level as well. That ground level space is going to house many of our art programs, our gymnasium, our cafeteria. What's nice about that, which we'll talk a little bit um, when we talk about the site plan, it has its own entryway so that for community use, because a lot of the community uh, folks want to utilize some of our larger spaces like our gymnasiums, our cafeterias, and whatnot. So that um, is housed on the lower level and is adjacent to the playground area for students to come out after they eat lunch uh, to come out to the uh, playground area and then easily accessibility back into uh, the building. So that's basically the educational spaces. Um, and again, at the end, if you have any questions from a programmatic or educational standpoint, I'd be happy to answer any of those for you. With that being said, I'm turn it over to our designer, Jim Ray. Okay, thanks. Sure. <coughs> 
I'm just going to point out too, I know these these images aren't easy to see in the PowerPoint and we want to wait to hold questions until the end, but we have printed copies of each of these lay layouts and we'll be passing them out just before the Q&A so you have a chance to look at them. Uh, my name is Gene Raymond. I'm one of many designers in our in our firm that are uh, working. I've been working with the district since 2015, and have uh, most recently been working very intensely with the school building committee over the past year. Uh, they've asked me to. Uh, Derek went through kind of the layout of the building and how it evolved to. Um, respond to what the what really a 21st century educational plan is and every every kind of district that's doing a project uh, these days through the msba program is doing the exact same thing they're they're envisioning what skills are necessary in this changed economy that we all live in things are a lot different now than they were 10 or certainly 20 years ago Anyway, you did a good job uh, touching on some of those. Um, when, what they had asked me to talk about is the site planning on the project, um, because not only did the Mitchell have uh, structural problems and, structure, and problems with air quality and all sorts of security issues, et cetera, um, the site at the old Mitchell was really difficult. Uh, there was one way in, one way out, and they were both from um, South Street, and you had buses, you had parents, you had uh, special education vans, all sorts of things coming in and out, uh, really kind of swooping around the street. It was super congested and, frankly, kind of dangerous. Um, traffic was spilling out onto South Street. Uh, you just couldn't get onto the site, do its business, and, and get off the site. So um, I know the people on TV won't be able to see this, but I'm going to point to uh, the old Mitchell was here in the middle of the site. What we've done is try to open up the middle so that we can uh, take advantage of having large parking lots uh, and having a separate, uh, shown here in red, uh, parent kind of rolling drop-off uh, in the morning. And what we're able to do by having all the parents queue up here is pull about 63 cars onto the site and pretty much uh, assure ourselves that there won't be any more backups out onto South Street for parents. Uh, the new school, like I said, is here. The single entrance that Derek mentioned is right here in the plan. It's right between the pre-K and the uh, grade uh, one and kindergarten wing here. Um, at South Street, there's a kind of a there's pretty wide property line uh, or uh, alleyway, we'll call it. Uh, right now, there's just that two-lane in and out uh, driveway. So. What we're proposing is to have three lanes for passenger cars. One in, one that people will stop before they take a right turn, and, and one that people will stop before they take a left turn. So again, we're trying to mitigate traffic backups. Uh, the other thing that we're proposing is a, a planted island, and then having a separate uh, lane here for buses to enter the site. 20, 24 buses that are going to be serving the school because it's, it's serving the whole town for these grade levels. So while the parents are queuing and, and kind of concentrated on this side, uh, the buses will have a separate lane that brings them around the back of the school uh, to an entrance right here uh, down by the gymnasium and the cafetorium. So that would be a place where kids can come in uh, and go up some stairways to their classrooms, or at the end of the day, kids can get marshaled, you know, in some big spaces and then let out into their buses. Um, instead of having the buses uh, come back and fight their way through back out to South Street, we spent a lot of time with the public safety officials uh, and then, uh, the town uh, kind of permitting departments. And what we're proposing is to formalize, right now there's a crossing here and there's an emergency access drive. So what we're proposing for buses only 
is that that get formalized into a driveway and then it swoop around the senior center and go out to uh, Route 18 where the public safety officials and the district have agreed that the best thing is the buses will go out there but they'll only be able to take a right hand turn and that's something the uh, district control, can control because the bus drivers work for the district. Uh, if cars went out there, some people might try to take a left, a right, and then it becomes a real safety issue. But the police department is, is very comfortable with this uh, situation. Um, around the senior center, there are a lot of improvements that are uh, scheduled in this project that speed tables, you know, wide areas of raised pavement as, as opposed to little bumps, uh, curbs, and a lot of signage. There'll be a gate here, uh, and there'll be a gate here, uh, so that this path will be only used by buses. It won't be used for commuters cutting through the site to get from you know South Street to Route 18 or vice versa. Um, so I think um, the only other thing to talk about is that we're making use of the existing play fields. We're gonna make use of the existing playgrounds, except take the wood chips out and put in a rubber surface, which is required uh, to provide handicapped accessibility. So it's still a soft surface, but wheelchairs or crutches uh, can, can work on it well. Um, then uh, this part of the site is about 15 feet higher than the back part of the site. I don't know if you remember the existing Mitchell, you, you go in at the upper level and you, you can go out at the lower level from the gym uh, or the cafeteria. So we're going to take advantage of that, uh, that grade difference in that slope and we have a, a really nice uh, playground that will be accessible after recess from the cafeteria uh, and it will be completely fenced away from all the traffic but it's going to have all sorts of things between uh, gardens and, and uh, you know, play structures and hard surface uh, areas. Uh, and then finally, there's going to be a pre-K uh, play area, a separate area with equipment that's sized for those uh, age kids. And it's going to be right outside the door from the pre-K area. At the old Mitchell, they used to have to come out the front door of South House, walk across, the, the parking lot and then get to a little grass area over on the other side of the, uh, the driveway. So um, we, you know, in, in summary, we, we heard a lot about the failings on the existing virtual <coughs> site and it's a tremendous amount of time uh, trying to address them. I think we've done a pretty good job. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Duff. Thank you, Gene. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit um, about um, so some of the community uses of the building. One of the things that the committee felt very strongly about was that uh, we not just build a building for pre-K to 2. Um, that it's, it is truly a community building and it should be a community building. So uh, some of the things obviously that, that have been built into the school um, <coughs> One a separate entrance, uh, entrance which uh, superintendent mentioned earlier, uh, that's accessible after hours. It's going to meet all the security requirements so that um, you don't have any kind of cross between student uh, areas and, and community use areas uh, at times when the community is using the building. So a separate en entrance. Um, there's a uh, full-size, uh, or I should say high school-sized uh, basketball court, um, which can be converted into volleyball court, uh, and also bleacher, a little bit of bleacher seating just for uh, people to be able to sit and watch an athletic event of some sort. Um, obviously, I think that's going to be one of the best used uh, community components of the plan. Bridgewater is a very athletic community, um, and consistently every available gym, um, do, at least during basketball season, if not year-round, every available gym is very well used. So that uh, that is a, a pretty big uh, piece of the community design, community use design. Um, in addition, there will be a stage. Uh, you can see that the resolution probably isn't well enough for you to see. 
uh, stage situated in the center between the, the uh, gymnasium and what is called the cafetorium. It's a cafeteria to me, but it's a modern day cafetorium. Um, and that'll accommodate about 375 uh, people. So um, you can produce some kind of event or show on stage and either have it um, oriented towards the gymnasium or oriented towards the uh, cafetorium. Um, and then, uh, and then obviously, uh, Gene described some of the playground areas, uh, which again are handicapped accessible. Um, we do have one relatively new playground in town that probably, uh, hopefully, will be getting some upgrades for handicapped accessibility in the near future. Um, but these would be built as handicapped accessible um, and also built for community use. So, so those are uh, those are some of the community use features. Um, I'll only add uh, again, we can't probably can't see, but there are music areas on that lower level um, uh, where, where the community use uh, is focused. Uh, so presumably uh, the ability to use music rooms for, for practice so that um, you know when your spouse is playing the trumpet because they you know the first time with the trumpet you probably prefer them outside the house in a different facility. Um, or when I'm at home and I'm playing the piano, uh, my wife certainly hopes that I can find another place to practice. Um, but the other piece, uh, obviously the site lends itself to a lot of uh, potential programming with uh, the senior center. So the senior center, for those that don't know, is, uh, is just a few steps um, to the rear of the building. Um, so we're, we're hoping uh, that as we uh, try to upgrade and revamp some of the uh, senior center programming that we can incorporate some of the uh, pre-K to two uh, within that, and whether that's sort of jointly maintained and, and uh, cultivated gardens, uh, or reading programs, or some sort of sort of physical activity programs, um, like to make sure that we can sort of um, provide a, an area and opportunity for um, separate generations to mix in a, in a safe and, and uh, welcoming environment. So, so those are just sort of some of the community use features. Um, and I will be back to discuss some of the debt and the bonding, but I want to turn it back over to John Garrish just uh, for a moment. Thank you. So the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, the budget, the estimate, uh, but I just want to talk a little bit about the process uh, before we get there. So for any municipal project, it's really a challenge to come up with a solid estimate ahead of time, this early in the process, we're only at schematic design. We're still defining the needs uh, of the program, and we've got to translate that into facility needs. So the three main things you can do to get the best estimate possible, not a perfect estimate. First thing is to have a good set of documents or narratives that define what, what we want estimated. And as you can probably tell from listening to Gene and his design team um, go over the design that they've developed to date, uh, we have a real high confidence in, in Gene's team. Um, he's an expert at what he does. He knows schools, and they know how to convey the requirements of the building without having everything drawn. And that's an important to a cost estimator this early on. Because the more assumptions and allowances we have, the further away from a a good estimate that is representative of what we'll see at bid time we get, and that's not a good thing. The second thing is to have uh, a great uh, owner's project manager. Shane is going to be talking to cost here. He's with Daedalus. They're the owner's project manager. They, they do part of the independent cost estimating. They understand the school building uh, MSBA process, which we're married to on the course that we're on. There are many rules, exceptions. Um, this is a reimbursement rate, how you figure that. Uh, it, it's, it's a science unto itself, but um, Shane and his team are, are very good at that. And then the third thing is to have a good <coughs> cost estimate. So the way this process has been set up is we have two independent cost estimators. We have Gene's team working with uh, Elena, who is a sub-consultant, and they're a uh, purely a cost estimating firm. So they bring their estimate to the table. 
And then Aglis has an in-house cost estimating, and that was one thing as an engineer that was important to me in selecting an OPM, is to have that expertise in-house. Um, so we take those two estimates and they're, and they're reconciled. The, the two cost estimators sit down and figure out if they're apart, why, why are you apart? Is it quantity, is it cost, is it schedule? You know, all of those things that go into the cost of construction. Um, we have a working a budget working group. A few of us were able to sit in on the reconciliation this week, and uh, in my day job, I participate in those uh, quite a bit, and uh, I'm very impressed with uh, both estimates, the level of detail, the knowledge that they have of what things really cost, um, and how long it really takes to uh, to construct a facility like we're planning right now. So. With that, I just wanted to give you that kind of preface of how we got to the uh, numbers we're going to be presenting now. These are still programmatic numbers, but uh, the, the estimate that's going to be presented to the uh, to the public through the building committee next week is very close to these numbers, and I, I personally have a high confidence in, in what that estimate is. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Shane. Thank you. My, my name is Shane Nolan with Douglas Projects. As John said, we're the owner's project manager. So we, we represent the, the district and the town for this whole process. And we also uh, are the DAs on with MSBA, the Mass Coast Building Authority, who are, who are partners. We'll be funding part of this project. And so, so that's our role here. We're, we're overseeing the whole thing on behalf of the town and representing the town. And as John said, one, one of the things we, we, we need to pour into at the schematic level is the, uh, both the construction cost and the overall project cost. We've been doing that, we've been tracking that for a number of months now, um, and we, we are in the process of rounding off and completing those cost estimates at the schematic level. I'm sure that that by tomorrow when we we'll present it to the clinic later on. Uh, right now, these numbers are what we presented uh, at the, P, the PSR for the schematic. Level a few months ago, this was sent to MSBA and approved by MSBA before we were the schematic. As John said, we, uh, we expect to be out of all of these uh, when we present on Monday night. So the first, the first line item there is our feasibility costs, 800,000. That's what the town has already appropriated. That's what the town is using to pay for this phase of construction. That's the phase uh, where we came on board, where Gene and his team have come on board. We've been, we've been working through that for about 14 or 15 months now. So that 800,000 has already been appropriate, appropriated, and uh, that's being spent at the moment by the town. Uh, second line item is the uh, cost uh, of the construction. That's what we're reconciling now. Uh, at PSR it was 65.9 million, we're still over that. Um, we're reconciling that to much more detail. We have those two cost estimates. We're, we're, we're much, uh, much closer to getting that. And we'll have that on Monday, and we will be uh, at that number, or I expect we'll be moving on to that number. So we're saving a bit of money there. Yeah, the third category is soft costs. Uh, soft cost is pretty much anything that's not construction costs, anything that's not the bricks and mortar of the building. So the soft cost includes any administration costs that the, the town may have, it includes the fees for the OPM, it includes the designer's fees, it includes all the, uh, the furniture, fixtures, and equipment that will go into the building, and then there's some other miscellaneous costs such as permits, uh, independent testing that we do during the construction period, and uh, other, other sorts of costs. So we're, we're about 11.4 uh, million dollars for that at the moment. And then finally, contingencies. Uh, any, any good project needs to carry contingencies. There will be unexpected things, there will be unforeseen things. So we carry two contingencies, essentially. We carry soft cost contingency, we cover any unforeseen uh, the soft costs and the design fees, the OPM fees, and any other costs, and then construction contingencies. And they usually run about five percent of the construction cost. We need to include that because we will, no matter how good uh, the architect are, no matter how good the consultants are, there will always be some changes in unforeseen or coordination. So we include that. So right now we're at eighty two point one five two five three six million. As I said, we're reconciling that. We'll have that. We we'll republish those numbers on Monday, and I expect that to be a little bit lower than that than what we're presenting tonight. Um, the next important thing then is the, the reimbursement through the, uh, the state uh, program, the MSPA's program. Each, each town has its own reimbursement rate. In, in Bridgewater, you're, you're at 56.53%. To that, there's other incentive points that you can get off the, uh, the state. 
and some of those incentive points are for the maintenance program. You can demonstrate to the state that you're going to maintain your buildings uh, after they're, they're built. After the state invests in them, they will give you some uh, additional money for that, which is a reimbursement. And the other one is uh, if you can demonstrate that you're going to build a energy efficient and sustainable building, they will give you additional points for that. So, so with the base rate and the additional uh, incentive points, the town is at 59.28% uh, reimbursement rate. Uh, the, the bad news is the MSPA does not reimburse every cost on the project. There's some costs that are not reimbursable, so it's 59.28% of reimbursable costs. Uh, the state has some costs that are categorically not reimbursable, such as uh, legal fees, permitting fees, uh, moving costs, we have a list of there that are not reimbursed those whatsoever, so they have to come off that. And some of the other costs they can. And this, these are caps that are uh, consistent across the state, no matter where you are. In the state of Massachusetts, every town in the city and district uh, is, is capped at the same rates. They include the, the cap of construction cost, which is $333 a square foot. That, that does not suggest you should be able to build a school for $333 a square foot. That's just a consistent cap across the amount uh, of construction costs, which are reimbursable. The other one is for FF&E, they, uh, they reimburse um, the district's $2,400 per student. The enrollment here is 740 kids, so we will get 2,400 multiplied by 740 reimbursed for any furniture, fixtures, uh, technology, and equipment on that account. And then the last, uh, the last major account is the site work. Um, all your site work reimbursement is capped at 8% of your construction cost. That's so, um, again, it's a, it's a consistent cap across the Commonwealth. That's to stop uh, cities and towns and districts going out and building, you know, stadiums and turf fields and some, some, some other uh, excessive uh, facilities that they may not need. So that's not cap. So when we take all of those out, what we call our effective reimbursement rate, we think would be around 40% of the total budget cost. So uh, we think that the reimbursement rate for the state would be around $32.8 million when we're, uh, when we're finished with that, leaving the town share of about $49.2 million uh, for the total budget cost. This, this will be um, finalized with the MSBA after we submit the schematic design, the schematic design on July 10th, or we're July and August, we'll go back to court by the end of August, we're going to have a, a firm number of the state will Reimbursed, but we think that effective rate eligible costs will be even 40 percent of the total budget cost. Okay, so um, what does all that mean? So the uh, sometimes there's a big disconnect between the project cost, uh, which Shane just showed you, and how that gets paid for. Um, so my job is to try to link the two and explain how that gets paid for over a period of time. So let's use a $48 million um, town share. Shane's uh, slides at 49, which actually highlights that this the, the numbers continue to flex a little bit here and there. And as, as you heard John Garrish say, um, you know the estimators have come up with an estimate. So between today and Monday, the numbers will change a little bit more. So. Uh, I'll give you a few caveats here. I'm, I'm using 48 million as a sample figure, number one. Um, and number two, uh, these are all estimates uh, so far. And, uh, and number three, I'm showing you the impact for the, for the school. We're not, in, we're not showing you other uh, issues and other capital uh, things that are coming down the pipe right now. We'll do that uh, a little bit later on. We want to make sure that you've got a very clear idea of exactly what this particular project is going to cost. So, so, uh, so with those uh, caveats, based on, a, on a, as Shane said, a 40% reimbursement um, and a $48 million uh, town share, um, you can see that the cost per average, I'll say the average taxpayer, the average home value in Bridgewater right now is 385759 so if you live in a, in a house that is $485,000, um, your number's gonna be a little bit higher. If you live in a house that's $285,000, your, your number's gonna be a little bit lower. So it all, it all floats depending on the value of your particular home. In the next slide, I'll walk you through a sample on how that, that works out. 
So based on, on what I said, $48 million and a 40% of which is uh, accounts for a 40% reimbursement from the MSBA, the average house in Bridgewater, the average house value for assessment purposes, the assessor's value uh, at $385,759. The, uh, the first year impact would be $482, uh, which is to the far left on the graph that you have in front of you. So the way bonding works, um, this assumes, again, I should have mentioned that before, this assumes a fairly conservative interest rate on our borrowing at 3.5, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But um, the far left-hand side uh, shows the first year uh, payment, and then over the course of 25 years, you can see uh, the, the amount gradually reduces as more and more of that principal is paid paid down. So by the end of the term, the average house, you know, in today's value, 385 and some would be uh, paying about $251 per year uh, for this uh, Mitchell School project. Um, let me step back and just uh, explain something that's actually not on the slide tonight. Um, one of the uh, factors to determine how the interest rate is set on, on the bonding uh, is, is uh, a review by the, the rating agencies. So there are two major rating ag agencies, one Standard & Poor's and the other is Moody's. Um, when we go back out to get rated uh, by, by Standard uh, & Standard Poor's and Moody's probably, um, they are basing their review on the snapshot of Bridgewater today. So I can tell you today, um, in, at least in terms of, of our finances, we're in far better shape than we were even when we went out to bonding on the Academy building. So, so we are very hopeful that we will achieve a very significantly higher uh, bond rating uh, than we have in the past uh, number of years. And how does that impact this graph? Well, the better our bond rating is, the lower our principal, uh, sorry, the lower our interest rate is on, on our bonding. And that translates into uh, uh, rates on a yearly basis uh, that are as low as possible for, for homeowners in Bridgewater. So uh, we've worked very hard to try to make sure that we can um, put our best face forward uh, with the rating agencies uh, so that when uh, this goes out to a bond issue, we make sure that we're paying um, as little as possible on the interest side, which will uh, lower the, the amount as much as possible. But, uh, all that said, uh, I just want to give you a very uh, clear idea of what um, our obligation, the town's obligation for the Mitchell School uh, will be and what it will look like for the average taxpayer moving forward. So as you can see, that big $355 number is averaged over the course of 25 years. So it's a little bit higher uh, at the beginning, a little bit lower at the end. Over the course of the 25 years, it's about $355 averaged. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, I'll just walk you through how you can sort of calculate uh, uh, what your individual, uh, what the individual impact would be, uh, just based on, um, again, the same numbers. $48 million town share, 3.5% um, interest, um, and, uh, and you can calculate your own. You take um, your assessed value, and in this example, the assessed value is 459,000. Uh, you divide that by 1,000. Then you multiply that by the, uh, the cost to uh, the tax rate of this uh, project, which is 1.25. Then you'll get the dollar figure as to what about what it would cost um, for uh, your property, or cost you um, based on your property value. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you just to highlight the, the project costs. Um, total project cost of 82 million, as, as Shane pointed out. Um, taxpayer share uh, is about, about 48 million. That means the MSBA picks up the, the other uh, the other amount. Um, so it's about 48 million dollars. Um, and then uh, first year on an average house is four hundred eighty-two dollars, uh, and then the total taxpayer impact uh, 
average for that average home over the 25 years would be about $8,800. So all total, you'd pay about $8,800 over um, all those 25 years added together. Um, and I guess that's probably as clear as mud to you. But uh, if nothing else, if, if you really want to try to calculate your, your uh, particular uh, cost for this particular project, um, your assessed value is 35,000 multiplied by 1.25. Mike, can you yes. just clarify that's only for year one, right? That is correct. That is for year one. So, uh, so that's your first year, your first year uh, hit, uh, and after that, it, it'll follow a uh, downward slide, as I guess you saw on the, on the previous uh, previous slide. <laughs> now I will pass it off back to Shane. And so, so, so back to the MSPA who uh, were partly funding this project. I just want to go through their, their, their process to get us to a funding agreement. And um, the MSPA uh, requires to follow their rules and regulations. They require everybody to do that. And um, while we can bend some of those a little bit, we certainly can't break. So we, uh, we signed a, a funding, or certainly a feasibility with the MSPA to get us the schematic design. We're going through that and following all their, uh, their statutes and regulations to get us there. Once we get the schematic design, we submit that to MSBA. Schematic design is what's going to uh, be used as the basis for the project scope and the project budget. Some of those designs you saw up there, that would be the project scope and the budget that we showed, that would be uh, fine-tuned a little bit on, on Monday and before we submit on July 10th, and that will uh, inform what the, uh, the project budget will be and what the state's reimbursement will be. Uh, in order for the state to, to enter into a, a project scope and budget agreement, uh, we submit the schematic design, as I mentioned. We then go to the MSBA uh, Board of Directors. Right now, we're on schedule to go to the Board of Directors meeting on August 28th, which is the next one. The board meets every two months, and so we'll go on August 28th, and we submit by the dinner on July 10th. And uh, if they approve it, they will provide us with a project scope and budget agreement. And the town will then execute that agreement and send it back to, to the MSPA. The, the project scope and budget agreement that we're using here is, is a contract from the state that says that pending a town goal, town approvals, we will reimburse the project for, for what was included in, in your schematic design and in that, um, in that agreement. After the uh, board meeting, the town will then vote on the project. It goes to the, the town council first, they'll vote, and then it goes to a town ballot. I think it's a two, two thirds majority for the uh, council. For the, for the council. The council, and then a, a simple uh, majority at the town ballot. The town council, we expect, will vote sometime in September, and then we'll go to a town ballot sometime in October. If that passes, the MSBA will then issue a project funding agreement, which would be uh, an agreement that they would fund the project fully uh, based on the project scope and budget that they had, uh, had approved in, in August of the board year. What happens if we don't uh, vote to approve the funding? Um, this is right from the MSBA's uh, website and medical literature. Uh, the MSBA would likely uh, fail to vote, would likely result in the school district being required to submit a new SOI statement of interest and a waiting invitation to a. Uh, so, as part of this, the, the, the district submitted a statement of interest and they were accepted into that program. The MSBA only has a certain amount of money that they can allocate to projects every year. Uh, it's not a. Um, you, you don't like to these, these funds. So MSBA gets about 80 of these statements of interest every year. They take the worst schools until they tend to run out of money in, in their pot. We were in that. If you, if you were, were uh, taken out of that uh, program, there's no guarantee you'll go back in. You have to go back out to those other towns and cities and districts that didn't get in and resubmit and start from the start. It's not that if, if you were 12, 12 times got in and you were number 13, you get in the next year. So if you don't, didn't get in, you go back in and go on eight or so districts. So we would like to be taken out of the program and have to go back through the, uh, the SOI and the whole state, uh, state of interest process again. Uh, in that case, we would lose that 32 million or so that we, uh, we looked at on the budget sheet. And um, the reimbursement rates change every year. We don't know how to go up or down. We got back in again. So we're not sure what the reimbursement would be. Uh, 
be a couple of years before we can probably get back in. And uh, as people may be aware, there is a construction boom uh, in Boston, the greater Boston area, which comes all the way down here to, to Bridgewater. So construction pr prices are going up somewhere between four and five percent a year. So obviously the cost for the construction that we have to do in three to five years' time, those costs are going to go up. So um, you know, it's important that we get the uh, the vote on uh, the risk being uh, the, the state's program and no guarantee. Um, these are the, uh, the, the scheduled slides. We're, we're looking at a couple of uh, different uh, schedules right now. So as I said, um, hopefully by, by <coughs> November, we will have, uh, we'll have an approval for the project to go straight into what's called design development. Uh, that will take about four months to do design development. At the end of design development, there's another submission to MSBA to make sure that we're on track, we're keeping to the scope. There's also another two sets of estimates done at the end of design development. It's a cost check, make sure we're still on budget. We'll reconcile, as uh, John explained, we do that with the two of them, we'll bring the estimators together. And um, assuming everything is on track, we continue into what's known as construction documents phase. Uh, during that phase, we'll do the same thing. At 60% construction documents, we do another submission to MSPA. There's another estimate done with the two estimates reconciled to make sure we're keeping to the scope, we're still on budget. And then finally, at the uh, end of construction documents, on 90% construction documents, we do our final submission to MSBA and our final cost check with the estimates of 90%. So there'll be another, we move forward with this, there'll be another three submissions and three uh, estimates done to make sure we're staying on track, uh, on scope and on budget. Um, and sometime October, November of next year, we would expect to bid the project. Uh, we, we're, we're, we're bound by the, uh, the state's procurement laws. We have decided to go with what's known as uh, Chapter 149A means we design the project fully 100% and then we go out to a set of pre-qualified uh, contractors. And the problem is the contractors before they're allowed to bid have to submit their qualifications to a selection committee that's made up of, uh, we made up myself from the owner's project manager, or we made up of somebody from Gene's team on the architects and two members of the community. Only contractors that we deem uh, qualified to uh, submit uh, bids on this project will be invited to bid. Um, we will bid the project and it will start uh, sometime November, December of 2020. We're looking at a 20 month project so we can open the school in September of 22. Um, obviously, the schools is important. We have that hard finish date. We can't open the school in October. We can't open, well, we can, but it's very hard, especially with what the, the district has had to do with uh, moving kids around. It will be very hard and probably very feasible to, to do that here in Bridgewater. Um, the other scheme we're looking at is to perhaps start the, the demolition of the existing building a little earlier. Um, there's a few advantages we see in doing that. We can break that out of the, the general contractor's scope of work. We think if we bring in a, dem a demolition contractor early to take that building down, that will eliminate a lot of the risk before we uh, award the contract to a general contractor. He can go in, he can take that building down and give a general contractor a clean site with, uh, with nothing on it, he can get going with construction. Uh, meeting. We think we think it <coughs> still take about 20 months to, to, to finish the, the uh, project, finish in June, July, and um, the school in September. And um, hope it's much more realistic uh, schedule for a general contractor dealing around about $65 million over 20 months. It's a lot of money. It's over three million, average of three million a month. And to do that, I think the uh, the option two is the way to go. And uh, that's certainly what we recommend. That's what we've done um, in uh, this building here with our eighth graders. 
from the Bridgewater Middle School. If it is a no vote, Rainham most likely at that point will no longer recognize that emergency clause because they will feel as though at that point Bridgewater has made their decision it is no longer an emergency situation. And speaking to uh, officials from the town, it would most likely allow us the remainder of the school year to remain in this building, the 1920 school year, with the expectation that September of 20, those eighth graders would have to be removed from the high school. With that being said, um, most likely the plan would be to relocate the eighth graders to the Williams Intermediate School, shifting the fourth graders out of that site because it's already tight with the uh, four uh, grade levels that are there. Relocating those students to the um, Mitchell at the middle, which is the former high school. And by doing so, then we would have to relocate our central offices. Most likely, we would have to relocate probably here um, at the high school. That would impact programming at the high school because we would have to find spaces for 25 employees. So there is a real ripple effect um, should there be a no vote. Um, and again, it would be a situation where you would add, then have um, K-4 students in a site that was originally constructed as a high school that's not conducive to the 21st century um, elementary program. So that would be the right now on paper anyway, um, what the plan would be if it's a no vote. But I will say that if it is a no vote, we would have to uh, relocate the eighth grade out of this building. Thank you. <coughs> on the next slide, um, the team is compiling a lot of information and pretty much everything we have has been posted to make it available to uh, anybody who's interested. Of course, our meetings are always open, so we love we have a separate section to hear from the public. We don't often have people, but we would like to have them come. So we're going to open it up to questions in a minute, but before we do that, before we run out of time, um, you've seen, uh, you've heard some from some people here, but I just want to recognize the efforts of the, the uh, communication subcommittee who worked diligently. They haven't presented tonight, but they, you know, put all this together. Um, Michael Dolan, Mill Holbrook, Renee Rushton, and uh, Christina Offer from Dallas, who uh, really helped mastermind this and uh, put the presentation together. So thank you. All right, so questions? Oh, we're going to pass out copies, right? Um, questions? Yes. I have a question on the bidding process that you talked about when you're, you're going to have yourself and someone from Mr. Raver and two members of the community and that people have to get qualified before they can bid. How would you determine, let's say three of you said, yes, I like this company, one doesn't. What, how are you going to decide to know this company is not qualified? So, so the state, the state dictates the, the criteria we use to, to evaluate the firms. There's also a scoring uh, matrix that we use. So there's a total of 100 points available to various, various categories or criteria. And so we'll, we'll, we'll get together, we'll score them. We've done it where, you know, some, some different ways where we'll, we'll all review the, the submissions from the contractor's firms. We can score them individually. We can take the average and that's probably enough those and other times you come together and collectively put a score for which the categories total that up to the see if it's 70 points a year pass fail so we'll do that as a community and what is dictated how we do it what criteria we have to uh, follow the state. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask the town manager how the other debt exclusions are going to what time period there was going to be ended so that the overall tax rate would be lower potentially. Uh, that's a that's a great question, and we we actually chose not to try to overlay all of that tonight, uh, so that we focus right on uh, this project. Um, but I think your question is: there is some debt 
we we say falling off. Um, so some of the debt payments that, that we've been making. Um, so over the course of the next several years, uh, we'll be uh, losing um, you know several hundred thousand dollars worth of, of debt payments that we're currently making. Um, but but I think our plan. I don't want to jump into those numbers just yet. I think we're we're going to give a whole presentation uh, to the Cat Town Council uh, in July on, on our debt position and exactly what's dropping off and exactly what will be coming on due to this and other projects that we've got. So. So it's not that I am avoiding the question, um, but I want to make sure I know those numbers inside now before I present them in a public forum. But but you're right, there are there is debt falling off. Um, relatively speaking, uh, Bridgewater does not have a lot of debt uh, currently, um, and uh, every town carries a certain amount of debt. Um, most towns, almost all towns, carry a certain amount of debt, um, which is helpful. But but all. Uh, That'll, that'll be uh, coming up at the next July uh, town council meeting. I think it would be very helpful if, if people knew that the increase from this building will drop in theory. It, right, it'll be so that the, the amount you're paying for this building um, it shouldn't be looked at in a vacuum, I guess. I mean, um, we'll, it's not we'll, a forever increase in their taxes. Right. Well, that's true too. So there's a difference, and I've, I've found that people are confused about that. There's a difference between a debt exclusion and an override. And an override. This is not an override. Uh, this is a debt exclusion. You pay for this building for the life of the bond, and once you're done paying, as, as you saw that graph before, that, that chart, you know, by the 25th year, you're done paying, so you don't pay that $251 uh, the next year. So that's true. But uh, look, look for that presentation. We're tentatively planning that July, at least July 9th uh, council meeting. Yes? Looking at the diagram here, it appears that the buses are longer and have a chance to run over the curbing. And they're trying to turn from South Street into the driveway. I would think you want to move the uh, concrete ramp back a little bit to give the rear tires a chance to get into the roadway. Okay. I mean, the, the, the entire site will be, uh, has already been designed with turning radiuses in mind, but we will talk to the fire department, we'll confirm with the bus company, and we're about 25% through the design at this stage. So there's still 75% of everything, including the site, that needs to be fine-tuned. And there's well, a lot yeah, of bridges out all the way to South Street, and I know the bus is coming up. Have to swing into the other lanes to right, make a right. Yeah. So yeah. Have to go up towards town. Yep. So the but, those cases, the curve is never set. <laughs> it's done by <coughs> highway department or okay. the client, but not the bus. Okay. No problem. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, I didn't quite understand on the construction schedule that you were talking about. You talked about doing demolition potentially first, and it seemed like you favored the breaking the uh, demolition contract out as opposed to the construction. And what would be the advantage of that? I didn't quite understand. Um, I think you thought that just that building will be gone before we hand it over to a general contractor. And so a lot of the unforeseen that we'll see would be the demolition when we start to take that down. We don't know what might be in the walls. We don't know what might be in the ground. If you get in there already, get, get that building down, take a look at the soils, see what we've got in there. If there's any unsuitable soil, if the soils will be reused as a structural filler or any other filler on the site, we'll know that before we bid it to the general contractor. So, I don't have to see, but there is a, a, a lag here so that any discovery here of unforeseen conditions, we, we would have to drive that in general contractors, contractor, be able to factor it in. But we're just trying to manage that risk, right? Because it's, yeah, it's part of the general contractors. On the top where you can see the first three red bars. Any, any unforeseen that we <coughs> discover would be. Uh, <laughs> we'll be dealt with through a change or in addition to the contract. Wow. I think if we do it early, we'll know what those unforeseen are before we uh, bid it to a general contractor and help them do that. 
as that bid price. So the first schedule uh, top is the demolition for those first three blocks. Yes. So, so it might be a little confusing. This this would be done by by one time of contract. Even though I show two lines, yeah. You know, it would take three months to demo the building, but that would be done under the supervision of a general contractor. He would go out and hire a demolition uh, company to do that. So we wouldn't actually start uh, constructing the building until here. We, we go out and hire our own demo contractor, we can get that done early, and then in these couple of months, if there is any unforeseen, we can, we can include those in there. <coughs> demo contractor's bid documents, so this really be here. And so we think that, you know, I don't think it would be any more expensive to do it out here because you're not paying for any uh, general contractor's overhead or supervision costs on, on the demo either. So I think it's a wash in terms of cost. But in terms of risk management, I think to do the demo first is, uh, is a much better work. So my follow-up question, you bring up an interesting point. You talked about construction, you're going to have four million, what, four billion in uh, contingency. Yeah. Who's going to control the contingency? Well, we're, we're, we're going to control that. Will we be in who now? The, the, well, the, owner, the owner's project manager will control that through the, through the school building committee. I mean, any contingency expenditure will be brought to the building committee for uh, for approval before we, we disperse that. Or the fund. town building committee. The, the town building committee. Town school building committee, yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to add on the schedule here. Um, we haven't blocked ourselves into this, but we want to present this uh, as part of the schematic design because it's easier to not follow it, have the approval and not invoke it, than it is to try to introduce that extra phase once we've been approved. But right now we think the benefits of, you know, uh, make it worthwhile. Uh, I think this gentleman back here had his hand up. Yep. <coughs> Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm very impressed with the design. Thank you for all your work. And I'm especially pleased that there are solid dividers in the gymnasium and between the cafeteria and the gym. I had a question probably for you, Mr. Swenson, about PE, because I recall in the old building there were the two gym spaces and there was also a third space. What is your forecast for scheduling PE? Will there be only two classes at a time? And if there's three classes at a time, what other space would be used? That's a great question. Um, we have one less grade level, if you remember right. now. So it's one less grade level, um, say 10 sec uh, 11 sections, two blocks a week, 22 blocks of physical education, less than we had at the original site. So if you really look at it from a K2 perspective, you're looking at about um, 33 times about 66 blocks. So that's about a block a, a, block a day times the, the five days, so about two blocks. So you'll have two classes in there, um, probably per period uh, throughout the course of the week. So I think we'll have ample uh, gym space uh, for that. We'll also have outdoor space, too, that we've dedicated solely for physical education as well. So right now, you see two classes at a time. Yes. yes. And actually, that, that gym space, it's a little bit smaller than the, the MSBA's um, gym space that we're going to put into this building is slightly <coughs> smaller than the gymnasium at the current Mitchell, but definitely one that could um, accommodate two classes uh, at a time. Thank you. Yes. And the question slash comment, I believe it would go to those working on the website. Back when we were looking at um, Proposition 2 and have overrides in town, one of the things that was put out was an actual tax impact calculator that people could literally plug in their value, it would pop it up, and it not only showed the first year impact, but it also divided that by 365 to show people what the daily impact is, because sometimes that feels a little bit more palatable to people if it's viewed in that way. Is there a plan to get that out there for um, the tax impact? We can, we can certainly do that. Yeah, we can certainly put that on the website. Yeah, so tell me more if you like that. Yeah, that's, uh, yes, the short answer is yes. Um, we'll, we'll put up a tax calculator. Once we know, once the numbers get a little more firmed up, really as of probably Monday or Tuesday, so we'll try to get that up there as soon as possible. And second, another great question, if I may, um, related to the planned opening is September of 22. If 
that is unable to happen, and it needs to slide. I'm assuming it would slide by a year because of what would be necessary to move people. What would the impact be if the opening was unable to happen in September 22 and it moved to September 23? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure in, in terms of the, the degree configurations, but if, if that were to happen, we would know a long time before that. That's not something we'll find out in July. That would be something we'll find out, you know, 12, 12 months or before that that we're tracking to be moving over. And that would give us time to, to react to that, to accelerate the construction, and more if we have to do And, but, you know, we can, know we can get the construction back started in October, November, and 21 should be any time to do Thank you. Carl, oh, do you have something? Yeah, uh, community use, I, I like the idea, but can you put the site plan up? Because I, having, I'm struggling where the after hours entrance is of the building, and whether it's on the back side, the front side, because my question is the parking and access. Yeah, the, the after hours, so the cafeteria is here, the yeah. gym is here, and the, the entrance to that level, <coughs> so the lowest level, is right, right about so it's on the right side. <coughs> so that, that is one of the comments that we've heard, and the, the nearest parking here is about a football field away, but there is um, staff parking, uh, in the back for the for the um, building uh, facilities group, and uh, after hours, it's our intention to have those marked for handicapped accessible parking only. But the other staff, if I might follow up, the other sure. staffing is about twice as different. The staff parking is twice as different from what you just pointed out. <coughs> uh, no, this uh, Carl, there's a there's a small little area here with. And, uh, eight or ten spaces, and it's much, much closer to the door. So we may come up with something even better as the design progresses, but we do recognize that as an issue. That's what I would encourage because people will not use it if they have to go 100 yards. You know, football field for some of us that are aging. Yep, it would be a problem. Yep, and no problem. All plus it's down, down the slope a little bit. So. Um, yeah, this this should be fairly low because it's about but you know I've heard I've heard it from multiple people. And it's our job to try to address it. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm 85 and I can't walk that distance. I don't have a handicap permit yet. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. But I can walk into the Home Depot and walk out and sit down. Okay. But as I say, I don't have a handicap. The other thing is the fire hydrant and the senior center, who's going to pay for moving that? Um, if it has to be moved because of this project, because of the road relocation, it would be part of the project costs. Can some of the dirt be put in the uh, pothole that's in the back of the senior center? Definitely, definitely get Don't answer that. <laughs> that would take the character away. <laughs> Just, I'll bring it back to the back here. Yeah. Uh, at one of the previous presentations, I inquired about the uh, possibility of solar use in the construction. Uh, has that been integrated, or is it being considered? Uh, uh, the, uh, the installation of solar panels on the building is not part of the project. Um, it's kind of, it's better done through grant programs. But the building, the structure of the roof, and all the conduits that you would need to run wires from the roof down to the electrical panels is all included in this in this project. So it's so what you can call photovoltaic ready for roof rooftop panels. Um, there is a grant that the district has already taken advantage of uh, from the electrical utility company, so that they're going to be. Um, two electric car charging stations, which I believe can handle two cars each. Um, so. so solar is not part of this project, but it could be added later. It could definitely is that be added. Is something that will happen uh, To be fully upfront, I have met with the committee twice now, I believe, 
and with the national grid, and we talked about all of these issues. Having it solar ready is important. I don't know if you have to have the building constructed first, and then you can go out for grants to put solar on it. Uh, we've also talked about small wind. So, but those are all non-reimbursable costs. So that's, and, and we can pay back the elect, that, that charge over that 25 year period. But it's a, the, the issue now is how much money do you put before the town to get the building functional? So those I consider to be something, personally, as energy chair, I consider those important, but something that we need to find other funding for. And we've also talked about solarizing the parking lot lights, there's a lot of things we've talked about that could be incrementally small, but important. Okay? Thank you. So nothing we're planning with our <coughs> We just haven't included yeah. any capital costs to do it. Yes, Mary? Okay. So one thing probably have to Carl is with the, the parking on the left and the green space on the right, Right Could those just be changed? Could parking be on the right? Oh, uh, you, mean, you mean that's the, the one on the there? Yeah. You flip that be parking and the, uh, and the green space in right. the over, so the cars would just go So you close to the <laughs> Yeah, we can we can take a lot, you know, we can take a look and, and believe me, I understand the idea about getting easier access to the after hours. Uh, putting putting the building, the parking, the buses, the cars, the playgrounds, it's kind of like putting together a Swiss watch, to be honest. Um, there's a very, very strong relationship between where this playground is and where the outdoor field is, but more, more importantly, where the cafeteria is, because the cycle during the school year is a grade level goes down, eats, goes out to, to recess. So um, this is kind of prime area, I'm sorry to say. Okay, I didn't understand it was a playground. I thought it was like... Just green area, yeah. yeah. And then I have my own question. Sure, yeah. yeah. That came up with just really, really little. In those um, regulation rooms, where you would take the deregulated students to calm them, are you considering the blue lights in there? Um, consider, I, you know, we haven't yet, but we sure. were sure. We're, we're, we're not done with design. Okay. Yet. We're, we're, we're I just wanted to throw it out for the last Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank yeah, I have one more question about the traffic flow. Will the buses always come in from south and exit on 18 in the morning and the afternoon? Yeah, yes, so it's all one way. Yep. Yes. How would that impact the senior center? Um, the buses, as I said, uh, will get routed around the senior center. We've had, we've had two or three uh, kind of meetings at the senior center and talked to the director quite a bit. And the last time she was actually pretty enthusiastic about the way we were um, handling this. Um, so there are a lot of, on, on the road that we're constructing, uh, there's a lot of kind of traffic mitigating um, features. As I mentioned, there's big speed, there's a number of stop signs, and then instead of having the free flow you have now, we're actually put the curbing so that people have to go to certain places, stop, look, take a right. Um, the, the timing, the afternoon buses are leaving after, from what I understand, after the senior center activities uh, end. And in the morning, there may be some people coming in while the buses are leaving uh, the Mitchell after drop off. But um, there'd be road markings and again, the signage and speed tables so that someone coming in from Route 18 uh, can take a left into the uh, senior center. In other words, the buses won't be a solid line, 24 buses long. You yes. made another comment on the buses when they reach Bedford Street, Washington Bedford Turnpike. Yep. They will take a right, right only. Right turn only. And that's at the request of the police department because they don't want buses or, or 
cars trying to cross a traffic lane on, a, on you know, and take a left-hand turn. How are they going to get up to High Street? I believe they go down, well, so I believe the name of the street is Winter Street. Yeah, Winter Street. Yeah, so they'll, they'll take a right, go down Winter Street. I don't know where so High Street is. is. High Street's on the north side of town. So, Derek, maybe you can address this because I don't know all So, if you're going to go towards the Halifax line on Winter Street, you would take a left. If you're going to go back towards South Street, you would take a right at the light on, on Winter Street. Say that again. Good. If you go so you, where Winter Street is, yeah. So if you were going to go towards the say the, the homes that are on the Halifax line, you take a left. Okay. And at the at the Winter Street exit uh, at, at an intersection, if you're going back down towards South Street, you would take that right. And you make a right on the south, go past the school <coughs> to say Michelotto Williams, which of the players. That, that seems confusing to me. We would have to work with the bus company too to see what they feel is the most accessible uh, way to leave there. So I, I got a feeling they're going to make a left there on uh, 18. They'll do it once. Yeah, they'll do it. The, the safety officials are pretty adamant that they don't. And you'll want put it. a traffic light out there too. Well, that has to go through DOT. So that right hand turn is buses only, though. Correct. Cars right and left. Yeah. Cars are out the exit. They know the buses only. But cars from the senior center will still be going out there. Mm -hmm. And the comment center and other. Um, Are there going to be four different bus schedules? There are three. <laughs> three tiers. So who's combining? I'm not sure what your question is. Four buildings. Yeah. No, it'll be the high school will be the first tier, the, inter the intermediate and the middle. Will run probably so the three same through eight will have their own bus yeah. and then it'll be K um, two, and then we're going to actually we're going to stagger most likely the start time of the pre K so that we can alleviate <coughs> some of the vans coming in with the buses as well. So the the pre K program may have a later uh, earlier start. They might be on the second tier um, than uh, the start of the third tier of the elementary. Could you tell me what the speed limit is outside on 218 at that point? I think it was high. It was 50. 50. It's 45 50. or 50. It's 50? Yeah. I believe. Gee, and they're going to make a right turn. People come in <coughs> up on that side to the left. They're going to stop 50 miles an hour right there for a bus. I don't think so. The bus no. can't go out there if the traffic's closed. No. They can't go out there if there's a car. There's good sight lines there. So if you're if you're heading if you're heading south on 18, you'll see the big yellow bus long before you have to stop. To hit it. Wow. I mean, you could say that about any, any place in town, right? I mean, we have worse, worse circumstances there that we have to look out. But you know, that's one of the factors. We we don't want to light. We don't want to have to pay for a light and have a permit to go through the process for a light. We don't really need it. We've had traffic studies, preliminary traffic studies done, so we're not doing anything that's uh, not recommended or not standard. So, But it's, it's a good point. All this will be learning, like even the interaction with the senior center. Since it's going to be a regular schedule, we think the regular users at the senior center will understand that they're going to have people with buses at this narrow morning and it's now time in the afternoon you will just get used to it it's like trying to get through the college you just don't go at you know five minutes of 11 or five minutes of 10 so you're trying to get your job any more questions yes um just in terms of the buses and that exit of Cooper 18 during times when the buses are not using that which is of course the majority of the time is there going to be any type of gate or something to prevent cars and other traffic from using that entrance exit? Uh, they'll, they'll, so when buses are not using it, the, the road out to Route 18 will remain the way it is now. Um, you know, the senior center, the corner center will all, all operate the way they do now. Um, when buses are not in, in play, uh, there's going to be a gate right here 
at the, you know, right at the end of the parking lot, so that cut through traffic cannot go onto the school property. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So it's going to be two days, right? The other end, so that cut through kind of Well, through. yeah, as Shane's mentioning, I, did, I didn't mention, but there's going to be another gate here, so that any parents or, or traffic during the school day uh, also cannot get through. Will they be a, uh, what's the control mechanism? Electric on the bus or? Um, it, it will be electric uh, if, they will be electric. The, the, the police department is recommending they have certain gates throughout town that when, when they come up to it, they can flip on their siren, the gate opens, they don't have to get out of the car and unlock it, fiddle around with it, et cetera, et cetera. So I think in, I think in Europe, when you have these big tubes that are recessed in the ground in the middle of the street, but when you don't want access, they come up. So you could do it that way also. I don't know the cost difference, but there are other things to just gate that you can come across. Right. Okay. Thank you. I think we can get those solar power too. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> With the battery pack. Inside Joe Pickens for come. Um, any other questions? Oh, yes. Besides the solar, Reggie, right, um, what are some of the other green initiatives here? Does it help with the reimbursement at all? Um, that's a good question. Um, the, uh, the MSBA wants you to uh, to uh, have a minimum level of sustainable design in the building. Uh, and then they do offer, uh, was it two and a half points, Shane, or two points? Two, two, two points. I think it's two more points of reimbursement uh, based on meeting certain levels of sustainability. And so this building is going to um, be very robustly insulated, for one thing, including the windows and doors. Um, it's going to have a very efficient mechanical and electrical system. Um, our mechanical electrical engineers have gone through a, I don't know how many pages it is, 40 pages of looking at what the energy code, of Massachusetts has an energy code as well as a building code, uh, what that requires and then looking at three or four other uh, systems that have been comparing them to the minimum requirements of the energy system. So the committee has selected um, a system that even though the building will be fully air conditioned, it has a very, uh, it's, it's much more efficient to run and to pay for than, than the energy code require. And the life cycle cost analysis over 30 or 40 years uh, is going to end up saving the, the, uh, the community, I think it's $1.6 million, if I remember, you know, kind of over that, that standpoint. Um, the system that they uh, selected also is called the displacement air system, and it's going to have it's got the best uh, indoor air quality rating of all the systems that uh, have been studied. Um, so all the all the pollutants in the air uh, all float up, and nice fresh air comes in at the at the you know, kind of floor level of the, of the rooms. But it essentially washes the room kind of constantly. Um, insulation, energy efficiency, um, water. Water, of course, you know, it's, it's kind of almost just good practice at this point, but there's no irrigation on the, uh, on the site. Um, so all the plantings will be native and drought resistant. Um, all the plumbing fixtures in the building will be reduced flow fixtures. Um, so that the idea is to uh, not only save in, in utility costs, but to just, you know, save that resource. Does the salt rain count towards that? You know, it, uh, do you have to eventually have to handle it? Um, we, doing all these things I'm talking about, we're already going to meet that 2%, and anything we do beyond that is, is great, great for us. but it's not it's no more you know, kind of financial <laughs> impact. Is it 20% of all? <laughs> so, um, 
No, we, we, we also engaged the utility companies. They, they do a number of programs. And so we've met with Englewood, Columbia Park, and Council already. And they're going to bring on a, a consultant to do some of that energy modeling with us in conjunction with, with Gene's consultant. And they'll pay for, they'll pay for 75% of the cost of that, up to $15,000. So I actually spoke to them again this week. They're going to do that when we finish the schematic design. And, and then they're going to look at a program where at the end of the project, if we meet their, um, their requirements, we'll get some increase in the same Thank you. <laughs> of course, I think of things when I walk away. But, you know, just getting down to the basics of the way the building is oriented to the sun. You know, we looked at a number of different footprints on the site. So this one has, it's on an east-west axis, so it has south-facing glazing and north-facing glazing, which is actually the most uh, energy-efficient way that you can set up a building. So you know, the more natural light that's in there not only helps test scores, but obviously uh, the lighting system will be able to dim or turn off depending how much natural light is coming into these rooms. So as a south-face, the length of the building is south it's south, a little southwest, um, and we can make use of horizontal sunshades. Uh, and so it's very, it's much easier to control south-facing glazing, uh, you know, uh, sun into the building than it is east or west because the sun's so low in the uh, sky. I think it'd be also good for the solar panels too. Uh, the solar panels would probably just be, you know, up on the roof, and you know, you used to tilt them up to kind of maximize things. You know, really. It's gone to the point where they can be flat and they're just, uh, they're just as efficient. Any more questions? <laughs> Anybody have any closing words or any thoughts or anything? Or are we all, we all set? No. All right. Yeah. yeah.